Good afternoon. You may be seated. Welcome, everybody. Um, we are going to call the case in just a second. Uh, I think each one of us will introduce ourselves um, and just tell you uh, where we currently are sitting as judges. And I'll start with my colleague to my left. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am Judge Bakke, and I'm the Chief District Court Judge in Boulder County. And I'm Judge David Archuleta. I'm a County Court Judge here in Boulder. And my name is Brian Boatwright, and I'm uh, a Supreme Court Justice on the Colorado Supreme Court. So welcome. We're excited to be here. Everybody take a breath. Uh, we, we, the thing I want you to remember is we want you to do well, okay? So we will start out, and I will call the case of Rodney versus Metro City High School, 18 SC3. If counsel could enter their appearances, please. And if you would also spell your name when you enter your appearance, I would appreciate it. What was your first name? Anai. Thank you. Okay, counsel. I'm representing Metro City High School. My name is Joseph Resett. J O S E E H R A. Wait. Please. So, on the last name, R A C E E T E. All right, welcome. I'm representing Metro City High School, and my name is Raul Silva, R-A-U-L-S-I-L-V. All right. Welcome. I'm representing Agra Rodney, Miriam Martinez, B-R-A-N-A-N-A-R-T-I-N-A-T. All right. I am representing Metro City High School. My name is Miriam Villarreal, All right, very good. And it's my understanding that we've agreed to go out of order um, at, at the beginning. Who's who's arguing first? You will. All right, counsel, uh, if you will uh, begin your argument. Um, are you going to be doing all of the argument? Or are you going to be dividing with your co-counsel? Are we doing each one eight each minutes. one eight minutes? Yeah. Okay. Very good. Sorry. All right. Do me a favor, counsel. State your name one more time for the record, please. Anai Gutierrez. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. All right, you may begin. May it please the court. My name is Anai Gutierrez, and I represent the respondent, Metro City High School, in this case. The issue before the court today is whether the First and Fourteenth Amendment were violated in its treatment of Ms. Rodney. The court should affirm the decision of the lower courts. Your Honor should find Metro City High School in favor for the following reasons. Metro City High School did not violate Ms. Rodney's First Amendment right due to their, with, with their disciplinary actions. The First Amendment clearly outlines the freedom of speech and expression. Ms. Rodney violated a dress code, and this dress code was implicated because she was being bullied and targeted by other individuals at the school. The dress code that she violated caused not only, because she violated the dress code, she was suspended, and this was because she was putting herself in danger and was disrupting the environment around her. Ms. Gutierrez, can I stop you there? Let me ask you a question. At the end of the day, we have to come up with a rule, basically, that applies to all kinds of cases. It's called a holding. What would you like our holding to be? That schools are able to regulate uh, regulate expression when it materially and substantially interferes with the uh, requirements of the school's operation. And this is the same rule that is the court from the Tinker versus Des Moines case. What did, what did that case say, Tinker? What does that stand for? Like the facts of the state? of The, the rule that comes from Tinker? The, the exact rule is that schools are able to regulate um, expression when it materially and substantially interferes 
with the discipline of the requirements to operate the school. In the case at hand, the policy that was implicated was not targeting Ms. Rodney at all. The, the policy was changed because as Ms. Rodney was being bullied, it caused her to, it caused a disruption in the school and the policy isn't targeting her in any way at all. The, the policy was created because of her, right? So how do you differentiate those two? The, well, the policy was put into place because the disruption of the bullying itself. So the bullies had already been disciplined that they couldn't, that they, for bullying Miss Rodney herself, her, and if this policy was not implicated, then it wouldn't have stopped. Because later on when Miss Rodney did comply with the policy, uh, it showed that all bullying had stopped and the educational process had improved. Well, let me follow up on that. You said she's not being targeted and just like Judge Baki asked, are there other students that were being bullied? Are there other students whose movement is being controlled, like other students that can't use the bathrooms? Mm, they, a second policy was added by the school, which was a restroom policy, and that policy was broad. It was to any transgender student who decided to use any restroom. It gave them three options, either to use a restroom that they were assigned, with the gender they were assigned with at birth, a unisex bathroom, or two of the staff members' bathrooms. But didn't that require her sometimes to like be late to class because she'd have to go to the bathrooms in a whole different part of the school? And wasn't that like discriminatory as applied towards her individually? It did cause her to be late to school, to some of her classes, but a lot of the things that arose with Ms. Rodney would use or any transgender would use the restroom in their the gender that they identified with most of the students and and their parents weren't able were, weren't okay with it. They spoke up to the school and they decided to have a meeting and from there that policy was put into place. So it so, was for sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead and finish and then I'll follow up. It was for the for their own their so, so their own best interest is kind of what you're saying. It was more like for their, like, privacy. It was for their privacy. For the and other students. For both students. So should part of our ruling be that it's because the parents are just not okay with it in terms of the use of the bathroom? Well, no, because all of the, the students, were, they weren't just okay with it. They felt that their students weren't having the privacy that everybody deserves. And Ms. Rodney, they all, the school also wanted to give Ms. Rodney her own privacy. That's why they gave her all three options to decide which one she wanted to use. Go ahead. Um, so you're familiar with the Kennedy test. The third part of that says that um, the, whatever restrictions it should be, it should be no more than necessary. Don't you think that the, the policies that were put in place by the school are were more than were necessary in this case? Couldn't there have been some other things that they could have done that wouldn't have affected this student so drastically? If they had waited longer, the bullying could have worsened. It could, um, it could have caused Miss Rodney to maybe even decline in her education and the students around her. The school wanted to, the school wanted to stop all of the bullying that was happening as soon as they could. And when they saw that some disciplinary actions that were implemented didn't stop the attacks from Ms. Rodney, they knew that something had to be done. Did the school make any attempts, and if not, tell me why not, in terms of some sort of less restrictive, um, less restrictive decision in terms of implementing maybe education? Was there any education that was taught regarding the transgender issue? To my knowledge and the state of the facts, there was no other education that could have been taught to the students in place of the policy that was instituted. Would you agree that would be less restrictive if they had at least made that attempt? An attempt could have been made and yes, it would have helped and not maybe not impact Ms. Rodney as much. Ms. Gutierrez, let me follow up on the, the targeting thing still bothers me a little bit. If we find and, and targeting sort of has a, a connotation of they're trying to hurt somebody. So, I mean, individualized or singular reason. 
if we find that um, that this was brought up solely for this student, does Metro lose? Do you know what I mean? Instead of it being broad, because you said they weren't targeting her. Is it is that the key issue in this? The key, well. Do you understand my question? No, could you? Yeah, let me Sorry. try again. Well, I'm just saying you said that they weren't targeting her. And I'm asking if we decide that, no, in fact, they were kind of targeting her, but they were trying to do what was right by her, do you still lose? Because they were making a decision based on her and her alone? Yes, in a way, because they were other things, as said by the other um, court person, uh, I'm sorry, honor. Uh, there were other things that could have been done and they could have been better and more positive things to help not only Ms. Rodney, but all students. But that was not done, so it would have been. And so you should lose? Um, sorry, my time is up, but may I finish? <laughs> may, I fin <laughs> may I finish answering your question? Oh, please, please do. I don't think that we should lose because there was a legitimate reason to be doing this. The school's goal was to finish, like to end bullying and do it for the safety of all students regarding, disregarding who they were and what they did. And for the, and to have a preserved learning environment. That was the top priority of the school. And in doing that, there were things that could have been done different. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it, Kelly. Thank you. Um, who's next then? Okay, Council, if you'll come up and introduce yourself again and state your name for the record, please. All right. My name is Joseph Reset. And who do you tell us, remind me again who you represent? I will be representing Metro City High School. All right, welcome. You may begin. <laughs> May it please the court, my name is Joseph Reset, and I represent the defendant, or the respondent, Metro City High School. Your honors, Metro City High School did not violate Ava's First and Fourteenth Amendment rights, and I ask that you find in favor of the respondent for the following reasons. First, the respondent did not violate Ava's First Amendment rights because Metro City's High School's dress code was not restrictive enough to inherit a First Amendment violation. Second, the respondent did not violate Ava's 14th Amendment rights because the bathroom policy at Metro City High School serves a legitimate government purpose. I will now address the defendant's claim that her First Amendment rights were violated. Can I follow up on something you said? You said it wasn't restrictive enough. What would be too restrictive? Kind of taking the argument the other side. What would be a restriction that would be too restrictive? So the... The dress code policy directly targeted a proven cause of bullying in the school where Ava's dress was bringing forth bullying and we saw that it was the direct cause as when she dressed according to the dress code, there was the bullying stopped in the months of February and March 2016. So the dress code was not more than it needed to be by only changing what was causing the bullying, which was the off-gender dress that Ava was bringing to school. But what would, what would be a dress code that would be in violation of her First Amendment rights? What could they, what would they do? Because you said it's not restrictive enough, so what would be restrictive enough to be a violation? Or can they do whatever they want as long as it's to prevent bullying? Your Honor, I would say that restricting uh, more specifically towards the student that was violating the dress code, such as saying that a transgender student has to dress a certain way or consistently restricting dress code based on that uh, that bias would be a violation. But in this case, they only direct clothing for men and women, which was already a fairly, it was a situation fairly put in place already, okay. the way that students dressed. All right, thank you. 
Referring to the case Tinker v. Des Moines, the Supreme Court rule applies in this instance. Schools may regulate student speech when it substantially and materially interferes with school discipline. Unlike the non-disruptive and passive protesting in Tinker, Ava's dress is different because it was the direct cause of inherent Can I interrupt bullying. you on that? Because you mentioned that point before kind of in a different way. Yes. You're saying the dress was the cause of the conflict. Wasn't the bullying the cause of the conflict? And shouldn't they have addressed that instead of what a person chose to, to wear that day? Shouldn't they targeted messages, don't bully people by the way that they dress? That shouldn't be a consideration, those sorts of things? Yes, Your Honor, it is MCHS's responsibility to limit bullying on the school grounds, but it was stated in the statement of facts that they took multiple disciplinary actions on the perpetrators of the bullying before going to the dress code to try to fix the, air, fix the situation. Thank you. Next, I'll refer to the case of Carvey Schmidt. The rule from Carvey Schmidt case applies in this instance. A public school policy can regulate student style preference. And here, Ava's wearing of dresses is similar to the hair length in the car case, and that is a style, style choice, and the school can regulate it. Can I stop you there? Because one of the things in Carr that struck me was uh, there was a conclusion that that was simply a matter of personal taste. In this case, are you saying that um, uh, Ava's situation is a matter of personal taste? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, why? So, from the diagnosis she received from her therapist of having gender dysphoria, she was given multiple options to begin affirming her identity, such as using different pronouns, things that were not restricted by the school policy and did not affect the bullying as uh, severely from what we can see in the statement of facts. So her choice to wear the dress was only one of many options to affirm her identity and therefore just a style choice that does not in inherit the need to break school dress code. But doesn't that sort of implicate the fact that she could control this? You know, for example, if you had somebody that had what's called Tourette's where they spontaneously utter things, that's like saying just control that, isn't it? I mean, because they, they diagnosed it. It's not just a question of hairstyle, it's something that they felt they, she needed to do. Your Honor, I would say that the very, the specific the dress code um, specifically keeps her from wearing the types of outfits that she wore when she was being bullied. That doesn't, it doesn't uh, specifically keep her from wearing dresses that are more feminine in nature, simply the ones that were directly causing the bullying that they saw besides when she adhered to the dress code. So aren't you letting the bullies dictate what it is she's going to wear based on their reaction? I believe that after the disciplinary action failed to reduce levels of bullying in the school, the need to change dress code was more of a general reaction to reduce violence and bullying on, on the, in the school without directly punishing any students. So it, it's a, the, re, the response from the school was the length of the dress, is that right? Or how much, the, was it, how much skin was exposed, is that? No, Your Honor, I don't believe it was. How would the, you describe it? The statement of facts presented the dress code as specifying the dress that either men or women can wear. But it wasn't based on any kind of exposure or anything like that? Not from what was in the statement of facts. All right. Now, I will move on to address Ava's 14th Amendment rights and that using rational basis review. Why is, that, why is that the appropriate standard here versus some other intermediate level or something? I believe rational basis review is to be used because of the similarity to the Johnston v. University of Pittsburgh case where it was ruled that the Supreme Court has not recognized transgender as a suspect under the Equal Protections Clause. And we see that the bathroom policy helped people who were, helped the students that were bothered and discomforted by her use of 
female bathrooms and didn't do more than was necessary by on, only maintaining what was already in place, separating uh, bathroom use based on birth assigned gender. Your Honor, as it appears I'm out of time, I, may I conclude? Please. Since limiting Ava's dress served the purpose of student safety and removal of school disruption, and the bathroom policy maintains student comfort and privacy with the most lenient enforcement possible, MCHS respectfully requests that this court find it did not violate Ava's Rodney's First and Fourteenth Amendment rights. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. I believe we were going to hear from the petitioner. Is it ready to go? All right. Come up, introduce yourself, and tell us what your name is again. Do I say my name first? And Please. Okay. Uh, my name is uh, Diana Martinez, and I represent the petitioner, Ava Rodney. All right. You may begin. Thank you. Thank you. May it please the court, my name is Diana Martinez, and I represent the petitioner, Ava Rodney, in this case. The issue before the court today is whether Ava's First and Fourteenth Amendment right was um, violated, by, were violated. The court should reverse the decision of the lower court. The court should find in favor of the petitioner for two reasons. First. Ava is expressing her identity by using makeup and wearing dresses. And so her First Amendment rights were violated. Second, the school violated the 14th Amendment because there was not an important purpose for excluding her from the girls' bathroom. As to my first point, Ava was diagnosed with gender dysphoria, and so her gender ident identification is who she is. Unlike Carr versus Sch Schmidt, where Carr's choice of wearing long hair was just a preference and not who he was. Ava wearing dresses, makeup, and painting her nails is who she is. Can I, can I ask you, there? let me stop you there, Ms. Martinez. How do we come up with a rule of who she is? How, why is that different than length of hair? Because Ava was diagnosed with gender dysphoria. It's like how you said, like, she can't control it. That is who she is. As um, with Carr, he could control it. And um, it was just a preference. It was something that he liked, unlike um, Ava. Do you, do you think that because there was a diagnosis that that means that Ava could wear whatever she wanted to school? Well, it's not whatever she wanted. It's what she was expressing herself with, what she identified with, which was um, women clothing and um, the makeup and the painting her nails, it was what she was expressing herself to be a female. How, how should it, a school whose like, number one rule is to keep the children safe, how should they weigh her need or her right to express who she is by how she dresses versus keeping kids safe and, and preventing bullying? Well, as how I see it is that they could teach the kids to know that that is something that, um, that it is okay to be different. That it, um, cause seeing that they suspended her and that instead, like they were excluding her from the bathroom shows that it is, it isn't right to be different, that it isn't okay. And so showing this, teaching the kids, cause that, that is what the school needs. Instead of like, ex um, suspending her or exposing her, they could teach, like their main job is to teach the kids that it is all right to be transgender. It is okay to be different. So how do we write a ruling that stands legally regarding someone's right to be different in this case? I'm sorry, can you rephrase it? How do we write a ruling in support of someone's right to be different in this case that's legally sound? that we are finding in favor of somebody's right to be different. Yeah, well, because that is her First Amendment. Like, her First Amendment doesn't go away when she enters school. Like, that is the law um, for her to still have the right of freedom of speech and the right to express herself. Like, it's constitutional. 
Well, let me ask, you, you state the First Amendment trumps all. Are there any limits on that? Could she wear whatever she wanted? Could she come to school in very risque clothing? Or, I mean, what would be the limit on that principle, right? I mean, even First Amendment rights, you can't, there's certain things you still can't say. So what would be the limiting principle on that that we would say? Well, the limit would be like how it is used now. Like you can't show much. Like as long as she's wearing appropriate clothes, like um, female clothes, it is okay. But if she goes like out, like even to the females now, like if they were um, a tank top where it's showing too much, uh, too much breast or anything like that, like. But what if she says, "But yeah, but that's what I do. That's how I'm different." Well, that's why there's different types of female um, clothing. Like, it's just not specifically um, like a short dress or a tank top. There's many different female um, dress uh, wearing dresses, and since it complies to every female in the school, it could comply to her as well. So, is, oh, go ahead. So, so the rule would be, whatever she gender she identifies with, she gets the same consideration as others that identify with that gender. Exactly. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And as to my second point, excluding her from the girls' bathroom caused her to sometimes be late to her classes as well as lunch, as to miss lunch. This is a violation of her 14th Amendment right to equal protection. This relates to the Craig v. Boren case where the court ruled for, the gen for a gender classification. The state has to show that it is substantially related to an important pur government purpose as it relates to Ava's gender. It is an irrational purpose. Can I ask you, you say it's a, it's a violation of her 14th Amendment right. What right is it that we're implicating in that by saying that you have to use this other bathroom? Do you have a right to use a specific bathroom? What, you, but you're saying it's a violation of her 14th Amendment right, and I'm just trying to figure out what right it is that you're talking about that we're violating outside of the 14th. Is it her right to use a specific bathroom? Is it her right to be uh, treated like everybody else? Is it her right to be on time to class? Well, her right is um, for her to be equally treated like every other female since she was diagnosed with it. So since they're not allowing her to use the female bathroom like every other female does, it's like they're, um, they're censoring her, her expressive content directly at her. So it's um, as like the Kennedy versus um, Bossier, the court ruled that the school can limit student clothing, but not if censoring expressive content. So if it is not directed at censoring the expressive content of student clothing or to improve the educational purpose, then um, it's okay, but they are um, censoring exactly to her. Like, they're, it's directly towards Ava. Okay, oh, go ahead. How do we weigh the rights of the other students in terms of their feeling of security and privacy when someone from um, the other gender um, is using their bathroom even though they have this diagnosis? Well, it's, in the bathroom, it's just a cubicle. Like, there's not really privacy gone out. Like, all you do is hear someone in the bathroom. Like, they're not, they're not gonna like peek over because she was diagnosed. Like, it's not, it's not like she's lying or anything. It's, it's something that was diagnosed with her. So she is a female. So, and since it's just cubicles, then it doesn't really. Um... Your time's up, but you can finish your thought and give us your conclusion. I'm sorry? You, I said finish your, you can finish your thought and then give us your conclusion. So since it's like a cubicle, it's not, it's not really much of like the privacy because they're all hidden from each other. It's just, you could hear each other. Um, for my conclusion, for the above reasons, we respectfully request the court to reverse the judgment of, of the lower courts. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Thank Ms. Martinez. Mm -hmm. Next, Council, if you'll enter your appearance and tell, tell us who you're representing, please. <clears throat> My name is Raul Silva, and I represent Metro City High School. All right, welcome. You may begin. 
Good afternoon, Your Honors. May it please the Court, my name is Raul Silva and I represent Metro City High School, the respondent in this case. The issue before the Court today is in regards to whether the school's dress code and bathroom policies are constitutional and therefore do not violate the First and Fourteenth Amendment rights of Ava Rodney. The Court should uphold the decision of the lower court. Would the Court like a brief recitation of the facts? Sure. This is a case about former student Ava Rodney claiming to be discriminated against because of her gender. At the time of Ava's introduction into this institution, many students and parents claimed that they felt discomfort with Ava using women's bathrooms. Apart from this, bullying on behalf of other students had been occurring to Ava due to her dress wear, but was otherwise unreported by her. As a result of this discomfort and bullying when caused potential distractions in the classroom, the high school established a dress code and bathroom policy that made Ava use a separate bathroom to avoid bullying as well as general discomfort within this institution. Mr. Silva, let me stop you there. What, uh, isn't the real issue not what she's wearing, but what other people's attitudes are towards what she's wearing? Yes. Then why are the restrictions being placed on Ava and not on the students who are behaving inappropriately? The dress code policy applies to every student, not just Ava. So therefore it affects every other student and the bullies were handled with during the situation where they were bullying her. But otherwise, there was no other way to stop the bullying, so they decided, the Metro City High School decided to put these policies to get rid of the bullying and the discomforts. Well, wasn't this more though like that um, Tinker case where they, they, they say they're making these neutral policies that apply to everybody, but they really created the whole policy just to address this person? Aren't they sort of targeting her? Isn't that what really is going on here? They're not targeting her. Instead, they're protecting her from other students who had already bullied her physically and verbally. So, in like I said, the policies affect every other student. It wasn't just because of Ava. Thank you. Well, couldn't they accomplish the same thing? If you are found to be a bully, couldn't they say you have to wear a hot pink jumpsuit then to school as your punishment so you can feel what it's like to be individualized? Well, then that's um, promoting bullying for other students and the school's main goal is safety and education. Okay, thank you. The court should find in favor of Metro City High School for avoiding potential distractions that would otherwise affect students learning, avoiding bullying for students such as Ava and for eliminating discomfort within the school, specifically in the bathrooms. Did you say affect learning? Yes. All right, so how did this affect the learning? So since Ava was being bullied, she would, it can be inferred that she didn't want to go to class because she was being hurt. And it could be inferred? Yes. And then distractions could be caused or have been caused because of Ava's dress wear. So are we making a ruling based on inferences? No. Explain that to me. Uh, the inference part was just for the further Ava creating the distractions in the classrooms. So Ava was creating distractions in the classroom? Yes, unintentionally she was. Okay. First, by making Ava use a separate bathroom and follow the new dress code, distractions would be avoided within the classrooms and therefore welcoming learning. Second, these policies decrease the amount of bullying done towards Ava, thus protecting her. Finally, these two policies eliminated discomfort within the school that would otherwise be problematic. Mr. While this Silva, case is Mr. Silva, let me stop you there. It, is it Metro's position that this is something Ava can, con can control? Could you rephrase I mean, that? she can control this behavior. She can just say, nope, I'm not going to dress this way. Um, what I'm getting at is whether this being transgender should be a suspect classification because it's something she cannot control. She may not control what she wants to be portrayed as, but she is physically a male still. If she were to have a surgery and say she was fully female, then the case would be a difference. So is that part of the rule we should make? Is that if you want to be considered a transgender that you have to have a sex change? No. What should it be then? The rule would be a student must use different bathrooms and dress according to the dress policy based on their birth, their gender at birth. And why is that? Because this avoids people from being uncomfortable in the school situation, 
students seeing a male dressing as a female, uh, like in Ava's case, a male, a natural born male using a girl, a women's restroom. Well, you heard opposing counsel who came before you talk about the fact that actually within that bathroom there are stalls. So there really is no opportunity unless someone is doing it on purpose, which would be inappropriate regardless of the sex using the bathroom to look, right? Yes. So why is there an issue about her using the women's bathroom if it's completely secure and private, as opposing counsel said? Well, before we implemented this, the policies, we didn't know that, our, that Ava Rodney had gender dysmorphia. So we, we obviously thought it was, she was doing it on purpose. And so as part of our rule going to be that we require that there be a diagnosis before anyone would be allotted? Um, yes, to avoid any unnecessary accidents. Any necessary what? Accidents. Accidents. Yes. Or can incidents. I, can I follow up on that? Does that not discriminate against people who don't have access to mental health services? In a way it is, but our case isn't here about gender. We're trying to protect her from other students because Doesn't safety and education is above all. Are you familiar with HIPAA? No. And the privacy of medical records? Isn't that requiring someone to disclose their medical records or medical conditions um, if they're going to use a different bathroom? Could you rephrase that, please? Well, how, fa how far do we go with this in terms of, is your bright line have to be that there's a medical diagnosis? Or no. can it be someone just articulating, this is how I feel and, and what I want? So what should happen is when a person is being bullied or physically harmed, these policies should be implemented to avoid that from happening. So it's Not based on their gender, based on the attacks on them. Right. Uh, While well, this case is referring to the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause on the First Amendment, Ava was not directly targeted, targeted because of her gender. A school's main goal is education, so when potential distractions are present, a school is legally capable of eliminating these distractions to ensure the educational process is unaffected. Can I, is can I stop you there? If, if you, you use the word targeted again, um, are there any other students that this applies to? The targeted part? Right. You said that Ava wasn't targeted. Are there, are there other students that are implicated? Oh, your time's up. You can answer that question and then give us your concluding thought. Ava was not targeted, be, be targeted because of her gender because we looked past that, my client looked past that and saw the bullying that was affecting her. Okay. Do you want to give us your concluding May I thought? Conclude? For the reasons stated previously, we respectfully request the court to uphold the judgment of the lower court. Thank you. For All right. Saying. Thank you, Mr. Silva. Next, counsel. Again, state your name and tell us who you represent, please. Okay. My name is Griffey Maps, and I represent the respondent in this case, Metro City High School. All right. Welcome, Mr. Maps. Thank you. You may begin. Good afternoon, Your Honors. May it please the court. My name is Griffey Maps, and I represent the respondent in this case, Metro City High School. The issue before the court today is whether Metro City High School violated Ava Rodney's First Amendment right to freedom of expression and her 14th Amendment right to equal protection. The court should affirm the decision of the lower court and on behalf of Metro City High School, we respectfully request that the court find in favor of the respondent. Would the court like a brief recitation of the facts? I, I don't think it's necessary for the facts, but I want to ask if, if we're talking about equal protection, and if you want to get back to that, you can in a minute if you think it's important. But you talk about equal protection. Who else's rights are being impacted other than Ava's in this case? Uh, the other students' privacy are uh, being impacted uh, because of her use of the uh, women's restroom, her want of to use the women's restroom. So is it your position that Ava then is impacting everybody else's rights to equal protection? Yes. Okay. The court should find in favor of the respondent for four reasons. First, Ava materially and substantially interfered with the school's discipline and work by creating an evident distraction among the students, Ava's bullying, 
Second, the school implemented the dress code because it both protected Ava from her bullies and limited the classroom's disruption. Third, the school placed the dress code in a way that did not suppress Ava's rights nor restrict her from her personal freedoms. Fourth, let, me, let me go back to what you just kind of said dovetails on what Justice Boatwright was asking you, but what are the other protections of the other folks that are being violated under the First Amendment? Under the First Amendment? Yeah. Of freedom of like expression and freedom of speech? What, what rights is she impacting? Is she interfering with? of the other students under the First Amendment. I think that that's what you said, and if I misunderstood you then. So under the First Amendment, not the 14th Amendment? Yeah, you said under the First. Oh, so under the 14th Amendment, I would say that their privacy would be uh, like compromised. Right, with but her what easy. about under the First? I think you under said the, under the First. Under the First Amendment, I would say her uh, th their equal right to like freedom of like equal treatment in the school's uh, workplace, e like education wise, because that's limiting. Uh, she was impacting their rights to an education? Yes, because it was distracting the other students from their education. Was she distracting them or were the bullies the distraction? If the bullies hadn't distracted her, would we even be having this conversation? Ava was distracting the bullies. So if she were, was distracting the bullies, wouldn't you think that she was distracting the other students as well? So students can invite bullying just based on how they dress and how they act? No. Who's more responsible, the bullies or Ava? I'm a little confused here what the school's position is. Ava would be the reason of why their freedom of education would be compromised because that's placing distraction among the other students. So this was a targeted effort by the school to, to keep her from doing that. I mean, they created these rules to stop her from distracting everybody. Is that what you're saying? But the rules didn't apply just specifically to her. The rules applied to everyone. Right, but in effect, that's what they were doing, is they were just trying to shut her down, right? Not necessarily. What do you mean? Because the, the school was in an effort to protect Ava as well from her bullies. And once the, bull, and once the dress code was implemented, then the bullying came to a stop. Shouldn't they just add a better rule, no bullying? Well, the, in the statement of facts, uh, it said that the MCHS administration regularly disciplined the students who bullied Ava, but that did not stop the repeated attacks. So they tried that, and so, so they, then they had they to go to they did try to stop the bullying, but this was acting as a last resort in order to both help Ava and the school's distraction. Thank you. You're welcome. Um... Third, the school placed the dress code in a way that, I'm sorry. Uh, fourth, the schools both provided an important reason for the gender-based classification, a reason that was reasonably related to the goal on which they were trying to achieve. Um, the school did not violate Ava's rights because her preference of clothes caused distraction and discomfort between the students and materially and substantially interfered with the school's work and discipline. In the Tinker versus Des Moines Independent School District case, a school may not prohibit students from wearing armbands protesting the Vietnam War because the armbands are a protected form of free speech. The court ruled the schools cannot regulate student speech unless it materially and substantially interfering with the requirements of appropriate discipline in the operation of the school or if the expression of the student involves substantial disorder or invades the rights of others. Mr. Map, let me stop you and slow you down for just a second, yeah. okay? Um, isn't the big difference between Tinker and our current situation is in in Tinker, the people that wanted to wear the black armbands were making a choice. And Ava, in this case, is not making a choice. Ava is making a choice because her diagnosis of gender dysphoria came after the school implemented the dress code. So the school was not aware that she was diagnosed with, their, uh, with gender dysphoria, so therefore it was just a personal preference of hers. Should, should we send it back and tell them to reconsider now that they have this diagnosis? Would yes. that Does it make a difference? I would agree that they should. Um, okay, thank you. Yes. The school did not violate Ava's rights because her choice of clothes also did not have enough expressive content to entitle it to the protection of the First Amendment, um, such as in the Carr versus Schmidt case, a school's dress code policy prohibiting boys from having long hair. Uh, the, the long hair didn't have enough expressive content because it was just a personal preference. This relates to Ava's because her dress, uh, her clothing choices were just a personal preference because the school was not aware of that. Uh, 
that she was actually a female at that time, or she was not a female, female at that time. So is the school's position really focusing on what was known at the time as opposed to where, what the school knows now? Can you repeat the question? Is your argument all based on what was known at the time? That's all that's recorded in the statement of facts. Well, let me ask you this. It, it sounds like you're saying now that we know this, we're willing to relook at this. I guess, should we just dismiss this as moot and say, go back and reconsider and see if you guys can reach an agreement now? No, because the, it, it, you, could still, you should still take an account of what happened from then to apply to this court. But you're saying the school district's willing to relook at its policy now that we have this diagnosis. Or did we misunderstand you? Well, the diagnosis was, it came after the school implemented the dress code right. policy. So they wouldn't, they wouldn't necessarily be violating anyways, is what I'm trying to say. So does the diagnosis play any role in this? Mm, not in the case of the, um, the viol uh, I see that my time is up. Can I briefly? Go ahead and finish that sentence. And then conclude. Okay. You bet. Thank you. Uh, can you repeat the question? I just forgot while so I was saying that. <laughs> should the diagnosis play any role in our analysis? Not for the First Amendment, but for the uh, for the 14th Amendment, it should. Okay. Because and explain. I know you ran out of time just quickly. Okay. Um, so the 14th Amendment, I'm just going to briefly go over the 14th Amendment. Um, the 14th Amendment, uh, it was suppressing the rights of others because of the privacy, and it should be held at a, ra it, it could be held at a rational or intermediate scrutiny because the school did have an important interest also, which was to benefit the other students and their privacy. Um, um, thank you for your time. Thank you. All right, welcome, Council. If you could state your name and tell us who you represent. Miriam Villarreal, and I represent Metro City High School. Welcome. May it please the court, my name is Miriam Villarreal and I represent the respondent, Metro City High School. Your honors, Metro City High School did not violate Ava's First and Fourteenth Amendment rights. I ask that you find in favor of the respondent for the following reasons. First, the respondent did not violate Ava's First Amendment rights because the dress code did not violate her freedom of expression. Second, the respondent did not violate Ava's Fourteenth Amendment rights because the bathroom policy does not treat her differently. First, I'm going to talk about the First Amendment. The rule from the Tinker case applies in this instance. Schools can regulate student speech when it materially and substantially interferes with school discipline. Unlike the armbands in Tinker, Ava's style and everyday wear did distract her peers and created a disruption in the learning environment. The rule from Carr applies in this instance as well. A public school policy can regulate student style preference. Ms. Like L'Oreal, let me sl slow you down here and let me ask you a question. You, re you referenced Tinker, and I, based on my previous questions of, of counsel, I'm bothered by the fact that Tinker is clearly a choice. The armbands are a conscious decision, and Ava's is not. Is that point unimportant, or am I missing something? Okay, so in Tinker, it was a choice of the armbands, it was a silent and peaceful protest against the war that they were, like what they were trying to protest. Right. Ava's style and everyday wear, um, it was proven later on that when we implemented the dress code, she did comply and nothing had happened. The bullying had stopped for um, the time of a month and then she made the choice to come back in a dress after the school had expi explicitly told her that the dress code was specifically to keep her safe from bullying. Okay, but my question is, is the fact that it is, I guess, is, is your point, are you saying that Ava is making a choice or that the fact that it is not a choice is unimportant? So Because I'm trying to figure out why Tinker applies here, because one is a choice and one is something that isn't a choice. 
Do you understand my question? Can you just rephrase it? Yeah. A little bit? I, well, you you say tinker is helpful, and I'm saying that there's a big difference in my view, or I'm concerned between tinker and our current situation. Tinker was a decision to wear an armband, where Ava's choice to wear women's clothing arguably is not a choice. Does that make a difference? So it does make a difference, but there are other ways to apply who she is and what she wanted to wear. She could have worn pants that women wear because women as well wear pants. We wear blouses. There are other ways that she could have implemented her gender than wearing the dresses, having long hair and painting her nails. So you're saying it is a choice? It is a choice. Okay. It was not clear from what you said before, but you think it is a choice. Um, and what's your basis for that? That she could wear something else to comply with the school's rules. Okay. Um, therefore, the school policy does not violate her First Amendment rights. MCHS sent out an email stating the acceptable dress code policies for males and females. And Ava continued to wear the opposite of what was required and the dress code represents a style preference. The school never stated that she could not use pronouns or wear female-like clothing. She just had to follow the dress code. Therefore, the policy was not more restrictive than was necessary. I, I'd like to interrupt you again. So for me, you kind of persuaded me that at least with respect to the clothing, maybe that's a choice. But what about all the restrictions the school did on the, the bathroom usage? That's a different matter altogether, isn't it? Well, yeah. Can you um, explain what your thoughts are on that? So, can you rephrase the question a little bit? Sure. The clothing thing, you said that's a choice. She could have worn women's pants and women's whatever and refer to herself with proper pronoun, all that kind of stuff. But in terms of what the school did to restrict her bathroom use and set up rules about that, isn't that clearly restrictive and, and beyond what the school should have done? So, no. The... Um, while they, before they implemented the bathroom policy, the parents had a concern that there was a transgender student going into the other bathroom. Okay, that, and, and, but that's not the concern. That sort of can describe something, but what really was the concern? So this person goes into the bathroom and maybe washes her hands or goes into a stall and closes the door. What is the concern? What's the school's concern? It's not really what the parents. Tell me, what, what was the school concerned about? Um, Can I ask you a different way? What were they trying to stop? They were directly trying to protect students' privacy. Like, that was the only ration, like, rationale that they had for it. But they didn't really have a direct problem with it until the parents came forward and said something. But, but you're not asking us to rule because of the parents. You're asking us to rule because the school is saying that there is a right to privacy for the other students. What privacy right is it that's implicated, that's being violated by allowing her to use that bathroom? Is it maybe being observed by a student that is not the same gender of birth? So, yeah, that, that would be it. And it would also be just, if you allow one student to, it, the school has to take into consideration every student in the school. If they allow one student to do something, then they have to allow other students to do that. So in respect of, how they have to run their school, that's what they did. Because they felt there's like going to be a whole flock of boys wanting to use the girls' bathroom. For selfish reasons, yes. Okay. <laughs> what about the stall issue? The fact that, that people can go into these stalls and not be seen. Is that? So it's not necessarily true for boys' restrooms because they have urinals and it's not as private as women's restrooms. How do you know that? <laughs> <laughs> In a, it, <laughs> I mean, stories you hear, I mean, you see it on TV. <laughs> That's kind of it. I mean, it's just kind of like... No, we're good. Okay, cool. 
Um, well, let me let me get you here. What what rule do you want us to write? What's our holding? Our holding would be. I guess it would be more that you have to take into consideration every student in the school and not directly one student in order to continue the learning environment as a healthy environment to learn. Because that is the government interest is learning and not necessarily, um, no, never mind, it's just learning. And that's where I ended my sentence. Okay, all right, why don't you? Can I conclude? Please, yep. In conclusion, since the dress code did not violate her First Amendment right to freedom of expression and the bathroom policy did not violate her 14th Amendment right to equal protection because they did not treat her differently, MCHS respectfully requests that the court find that it did not violate Ava's First and 14th Amendment rights. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you. Yep. Yep, we will do that. We will be in recess for about five minutes.
Maybe seated. Thank you. We are missing someone. All right. There are no bathroom breaks here. <laughs> which bathroom? Yeah. yeah, which bathroom did you use? Then? <laughs> well, uh, let me, I'll start off with just sort of a general thing. Um, I want to congratulate all six of you guys for the work that you did. That, you guys were terrific. I mean, I, I work in the appellate courts and you guys could teach a number of the lawyers a lesson or two. So uh, really, really well done. Yeah. So we're gonna, uh, just so you know, we're gonna start off with, uh, each one of us is gonna kind of give a little bit of a critique and some suggestions and then we'll announce the best oralist. So don't sit there and think, did I win? Did I win? Did I win? As we go through this. Um, this is a very natural, uh, well, first of all, let me start out with a positive. I thought all of you had excellent eye contact, mm -hmm. that you were not looking around. And I can't tell you how many times there are lawyers, you can tell they're looking above us as they're making an argument, and it's really distracting. But all of you had really good eye contact when you, when you made your argument. Um, another thing, a, a suggestion that I would have for each one of you is slow down. Um, it's really a very natural thing, especially when you're nervous to do that. But I can tell you that one of the more effective things that you can do in any type of oral presentation is to slow down. It gives you, it gives emphasis to your point by slowing down. You know how some people yell when they wanna make a point? Sometimes going softer or slowing down can emphasize the same point. Um, so really concentrate on that. I thought all of you did a better job when we asked questions than when you went back to your notes because you had it written out and you would, you would, you would answer us in a very conversational tone and then you'd go back to your notes and it was like you stepped on the gas. Um, because it was very comfortable. So have a note next to your written uh, process of slow down, just to remind yourself to take a breath, or even on a point, say breathe. You know, what I used to describe to people is pausing sometime can be one of the most effective things that you do. It gives it a second to sort of soak in. So, um, but way to go. I thought all you guys were excellent, so. Um, yeah, I would like to just restate some of those things because eye contact, how you, you know, how much communication is just physical, right? How you stand, your cadence of your voice, um, how you look at the judges exudes confidence. If you look at us kind of individually, I would even say go so far as to try to do that. Just don't sort in general. But when you come in, if you're going to go to this higher level of competition, you want to kind of look at each judge and make that eye contact um, and get them engaged with you. And, and, a, and a good way to also sort of give yourself a little break when a judge throws a question at you is to say, that's a really good question. 
and then here's my answer and, you know, get that out there. And it seems like, wow, you just acknowledged that that was going to be a tough question and you were able to answer that. And I agree with Justice Boatwright in terms of trying to stay off script. Um, and I know that you have this, but what you'll notice is that each one of you started the same way. And, and, and I, I don't know if that's uh, – this particular process is unfamiliar to you. I usually do the mock trial, so it's a little bit different for me. But the more you can make your presentation different from the other person's but still be effective is really what you want to do. And I understand that you didn't – was it you, Ms. Martinez, you didn't expect to make to the top six? See, now, but it was a big learning experience. You, you, you know, all of you did an excellent job, and that should be a lesson to all of you that it's never over till it's over. And you need to have confidence in the fact that you're going to do very well, and you all did really, really well. And even when I threw kind of that silly question to you, <laughs> you did a nice job. So you all should be extremely proud of yourselves. I hope you all go to D.C. and have a great time. Um, so thank you for letting us come and judge. Uh, I think you guys are all winners. I think everybody that participated in this in this whole competition are winners to put your time and energy in it and do this. You're stretching yourself so much. I mean, just think of what you learned, you know, just in, in this time. And it was really hard for us to figure out, you know, who we thought you could all have been the winners of this. Um, to echo a little bit what uh, Judge Bakke said, um, it, it is okay to take a breath and to think about your response before you answer. It shows that you're actually thinking about it. Um, and people uh, respect that. They know that the wheels are turning there and you're not just off script. So that's okay. Do yourself a favor, take a break, and do that sometimes. If you've never thought of the question before, the way that the particular person has asked you, take some time to think about that before you give the response and it'll It'll impress them. And, you know, judges are human beings too, and all these judges that will be judging the competition in, in Washington, if you're able to go there, they're going to look for that connection, you know. So if you make eye contact, um, if you show that you're really thoughtful about it, and if you have mastery of the subject matter, that's all going to help because then you're going to feel comfortable, you're going to stand there, and you're going to feel ready like, well, I've thought about that already, and if they ask me that, I'm going to do this, or I haven't thought about that. And, and give me a minute to think about it, and I'll give you a good response. That's all very effective, persuasive um, advocacy, and so I'd encourage you to do that. But you guys are all winners already. You did a great job, and I was impressed by how little you were distracted by our questions. I mean, sometimes it would shut you down for a while, but you'd usually relax then after that, come back and answer the question appropriately, and that's a great skill. I mean, that'll serve you in life whether you become lawyers or not, or whatever you do in your life. So good job, everybody. Yeah. Um, final thing I want to say, if, if you guys do have the opportunity to go on, it, it's something I said at the very beginning, and I don't think pe people think about this, but the people who are judging this want you to do really well. It, it's, it's more enjoyable if you're doing well. It's easier to ask questions. And they wouldn't do it if they don't care about you. So remember that even though people are doing the judging, they want you to do well. So they're cheering for you, you know, when you go up there and do that. And I think it, I, I never really had thought about that until I got on this side of, of the bench. You know, I want a really well-tried case. I want a really well-argued case. And, you know, since you guys are high school students, they really want you to do well. They want you to be comfortable, and they, they want you to knock their socks off. So just keep that in mind. With that said, um, as, as uh, Judge Archuleta said, everybody here, <laughs> we, we, at one point we voted for all of you in this, um, and, but we had to come up with one person, um, and so we decided that would be Ms. Villarreal. So congratulations. <laughs> One of the things that we acknowledged in doing this was um, we started asking harder questions, I think, as we went along in the, in the, in the process. Um, so, uh, but anyway, I, you guys all did a great job. And I can't tell you uh, how close it was amongst all of you. Each one of you was given really strong consideration. And we all, I think we all had you in our top two.
in one configuration or another. So, um, so congratulations and a great job, you guys. So you should be very proud of yourselves. And I don't know why you didn't think you were going to be here because you were great. So, <laughs> so yeah. Okay. Professor, or Justice right, Hart, thank you. anything? Thank you.